Hello, this is Miss Augustine, and today we're continuing our Chapter 6 notes, and we're talking about covalent bonding at the moment, and we're going to talk about chemical formulas today. So when we talk about chemical formulas, um, we're talking about formulas that show what is found in a chemical compound. So it tells me the types of atoms and the numbers of atoms. So monatomic elements are represented typically just using their atomic symbols, like helium is HE. And if there's more than one atom present, the number of atoms is represented by a subscript. So, for instance, for hydrogen, which is a molecule, we show the element symbol H, and then the two means that there's two of them involved. So for molecular compounds, these are neutral groups of atoms held together by covalent bonds. So when you say molecular compound, it means something that is held together with covalent bonds, and that means that it is non-metal, non-metal bonds. So it's uh, bonds between non-metallic elements. And the non-metallic elements are found in the upper right-hand portion of the periodic table. So molecular compound is a chemical compound whose simplest units are molecules. And if you think about it, covalent bonds uh, result when atoms are forced to share electrons. So if they're sharing electrons over many atoms, you have a molecule. So a molecular compound is made up of the simplest unit, a molecule. And the molecular formula shows the types and numbers of atoms combined in a single molecule of a covalently bonded compound, which is a molecular compound. So the molecular formula, as I said, shows the type of atoms and the numbers present in a molecule. An example would be the molecular formula of water. Molecular meaning it's covalently bonded, so the formula for water is H2O. Notice, hydrogen has a subscript because there are two of them. Oxygen does not have a subscript because there's only one. So when there's only one, we do not use a subscript. One is understood. And again, it tells us the composition of a molecule of a substance. It doesn't tell us how they're hooked together, though. So a formula, a molecular formula, tells you which types of elements and how many are present in a molecule, but it doesn't tell you how they're stuck together. It doesn't tell you the structure. And so for that, we need a different type of formula, and we call those, shockingly, structural formulas. So before we go on to that, though, I like to talk about the diatomic molecules. It turns out that there are a bunch of elements, and they're called, shockingly, diatomic elements. Um, they're a group of elements that exist as molecules of two atoms. So they're a group of elements that naturally exist as two atoms covalently bonded together. And the seven of them that we want you to memorize, and we call them the magnificent seven, are hydrogen, fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The magnificent seven. And I will show you how to find them on the periodic table. So here is a periodic table, and you will see that I've highlighted in yellow hydrogen, who's kind of off by himself, and then the rest of the seven diatomic elements. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you can see that if you can locate nitrogen on the periodic table, you can locate the uh, seven diatomic elements. They form a seven on the periodic table. There's another way that you can um, memorize them, and it's using the word Brinkelhoff, which I will show you also. So if you use this word, Brinkelhoff, you have to remember that the C is a C and not a K, you have the seven diatomic elements. There's bromine, there's iodine, there's nitrogen, there's chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. So there's two ways to find the seven diatomic elements, which will be important when we get to chapter eight about reactions, because you have to remember which ones always get a two. So hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, and the word Brinkelhoff helps you remember them. So structural formulas 
are um, formulas that show electron pairs using the dot structures and instead of putting all of the dots there you make a line instead to show the structural formula. So if there's a single bond which would be one line chlorine and chlorine and what that line means is that there's an electron from this chlorine and an electron from this chlorine. If there's a double bond you would use two lines so that means there's two pairs of electrons so one one and one one from each oxygen. And if there are three pairs of electrons being shared in a triple bond, we would show three sets of lines. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Six electrons being shared. Another thing we can use to show what's going on with a molecule are models. And there's a variety of different types of models that show the arrangement of molecules. So you can just write an H3, which is just a straight up structural formula, molecular formula. Or you could show it in two dimensions as a nitrogen attached to three hydrogens. Or you could use something called a space filling model. And this is actually showing what the electron cloud would look like. And so the nitrogen is the dark blue and then the three hydrogens are the light blue. You can use a um, three dimensional model even though it's on paper in 2D and here it's showing the nitrogen with an unshared pair of electrons. These dashed lines mean that this hydrogen is behind the plane of the paper. This wedge filled in means it's coming out of the paper at me and this straight line means it's in the same plane as the paper. And then the uh, last type that we show is a so-called ball and stick model, which you may have used at the junior high with the little wood balls and the little wood sticks, and that would be, again, ammonia, the nitrogen, and the three hydrogens. We also like to talk about one more thing called a resonance structure, and that is any time you could draw two or more equally valid electron dot structures, then it is said to be a resonance structure. So let's look at ozone, which is um, three oxygens bonded together. And the way we know that it is true is that the bond length is the same between all of the oxygens. We can measure it. So sometimes there's a single bond between these two and a double between these two and a double between these two. So what's happening is the double bond is flipping back and forth between the oxygens. And as I said, the way we know it's true is that the bond distance between all of the oxygens is the same. So that's just known as a resonance structure and you just need to know the definition. If you can draw two or more equally valid dot structures then that means it's resonance. And that leads us to something called VSEPR theory. It stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. And it is used to predict the shape of molecules. And it's quite accurate. So if you think about it, bonds are made from electron pairs. And so there's two types of electron pairs an atom may have. Bonding pairs, for instance, like between two hydrogen atoms. And lone pairs, things like nitrogen and oxygen that have other electrons that are not involved in a bond. They're just sort of hanging out together. And what's going on with the repulsion theory is electrons are all negative. And when you have these groups of electrons, they're going to try to get as far apart from each other in space as possible. So the bonding pairs and the lone pairs, the unshared pairs of an atom are negatively charged and are going to rearrange themselves so that they're as far apart from each other as possible. So Vesper theory describes this ten tendency of electron pairs to adjust their orientation and the orbital orientation to maximize the distance between them. And it depends on the number of electrons or atoms bonded around a central atom. So the bond angle that results is caused by this repulsion. So the shape is characterized by the bond angle between the central atom and everything bonded to it. 
So unpaired electrons around a central atom play a large role in determining the molecule's 3D shape because any time you have unpaired electrons, they're taking up space in an orbital and they tend to repel away everything else and it's a very strong repulsion. So, so to restate this, the negatively charged electrons are repelling each other and the electron pairs in the various orbitals are going to stay as far apart from one another as they can. So the number of electron pairs determines the shape of the molecule. We do not hold you responsible for figuring all of this out. Um, in honors chem we give them a chart and they have to figure out what the shape will be and I'm just going to show you the shapes that we typically talk about. So depending on the number of electron pairs, whether there's two, three, or four, whether some of them are unshared and some of them are in bonding pairs, it changes the shape. So what do they look like? So if there's only two electron pairs around something, the bond angle is 180 degrees, it's going to be linear and it's going to look like this and this happens to be carbon dioxide, so the carbon is the black one and the oxygens are red. If it is three things and there are no unshared pairs or lone pairs, you'll get trigonal planar and it would look like this. If there are four electron pairs, we get something called tetrahedral shape and it looks like this. If there are four things but one of them is an unshared pair as in ammonia you get something that looks like this trigonal pyramidal and you can imagine there's this big unshared orbital up here and you can also get um, when there are four things and two of them are unshared pairs you'll get this bent structure and this is sulfur dioxide. So the last thing we talk about is the polarity of covalent bonds. Polar bonds are bonds with uneven sharing of the electrons. Nonpolar bonds, as we learned earlier in this um, notes section, are bonds with even sharing of electrons. And the polarity of the molecule depends on two things, the bond type and the shape of the molecule. So if there's all nonpolar bonds, you'll have a nonpolar molecule. If you have polar bonds, it's going to depend on whether or not the geometry um, lends to a polar molecule or a nonpolar molecule. So you can have polar bonds and you can end up with a polar molecule like water. And in other situations, you could have polar bonds, but because of the geometry, you end up with a nonpolar molecule. So for now, we'll do a worksheet that talks a little bit more about this polar and nonpolar bonds and the shape of molecules. But for now, this is Ms. Augustine signing off.